Thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, I will start with some motivation and I will use some of the concepts that already uh, uh, that were introduced in the last talk. So in this in this blackboard I will just like <coughs> write like the the direction we are moving to. So a bit of motivation. So as mentioned in the last talk, the, the input to construct a cluster algebra is a quiver. So the quiver is assumed to be finite and with some extra conditions that is uh, without loop nor two cycles, but for the purpose of this talk, we will assume that it's acyclic. So, so we will take skew acyclic quiver without loops, uh, without a finite type. So here we mentioned that there's a, not like with this input, there's a sort of algebra, AQ, the cluster algebra. And he already said where it's contained. It's contained in this uh, certain algebra of this, of this ring. So n is the number of vertices. And uh, he said that there's a, Categorical point of view to understand this object. So, so the categorification it's given by a certain orbit category. So in this talk I will talk much more in, in details about this orbit category. And it's given by the, the right category of the model category of the path algebra. So here okay, I will take a since we're not talking about geometry or, or anything, we will just be happy with that algebraically close the field. And he, he takes an orbit category with respect to a distinguished automorphism of this category with this sigma composed with the inverse of the outlander translation. So uh, in nature, the, there are other kind of cluster algebras. In nature, there is are way too easy to, to appear in nature. They, we have to generalize a little bit the definition. For instance, uh, the coordinate rings over the a cone of, I mean, consider the Grismanians as a project variety, take the, the, the cone of this variety, take the coordinate ring. This, this uh, algebra will have uh, a structure of cluster algebra with some extra data. So we will have cluster algebra coefficient. So they will be denoted quite similar. They will depend on some uh, extra data that I will call P. And they will be contained in a slightly more complicated ring. So the coefficients will be taken here. <coughs> and we will have the same set of variables. Yes? So the, the, the hope of this stuff, the hope is to categorify these objects using also orbit categories of some other objects. So hope, categorify uh, this thing using orbit categories. As well. So just to let you know which is the, the extra data. So I mean the whole feeling of cluster algebra is about recursion. So we have an initial thing, and then we we, we have a recursion pr procedure to create the generators. So here, the, the initial data will be just a subset of this coefficient ring. OK, so here is M, and here is M. They, may, they might be different. So. So first of all, I will I will not define what the cluster algebra is, but I will give an explicit example of how this orbit <coughs> category looks like in a very uh, simple example type, uh, of type A3, thinking type A3. So, <coughs> so uh, uh, okay, so I will, I will start recalling some classic theorem of Happel. 
Yes? So we will let Q be an infinite number. So we just to fix idea you can take Q this eight three primer. And uh, so define the repetitive quiver by, I mean, the vertices are going to be of the form vertices of Q. I will denote this by Q0 times the integer. Yes? <laughs> And the arrows, I will record them in a drawing. So, first of all, the vertices is this set of vertices times the integer. So, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 2, 0, 2, 3, 0. So, it's a first copy of this, of the, this quiver, a second quip, copy of the quiver. Third copy of the of the quiver, etc. Constantly many. <coughs> okay, and uh, we will connect these copies of the quiver by certain connecting <coughs> arrows. <coughs> so we will. For each vertex in a copy, for each arrow connecting joining two vertices in one copy of this original quiver, we will add a connected arrow going in the opposite direction. So from here I have a, an arrow from A to J, I will have an arrow from J to I from to the next copy. Yeah? So the arrows I will call this alpha copy zero. It will be sigma alpha of this copy of, of alpha. So they will, I will note that like alpha, q1 times z. So here, q1 is the arrow of q. Yeah? So we, will, we get this infinite quiver. Which will help us to describe the, the quiver of the derived category, this one. So let me recall that you have your quiver, you can associate the path algebra. This quiver is certain algebra associated to the quiver. You can consider the category of right modules over this algebra. And since it's an abelian category, I can consider the derived category of this guy. I will call it this perfected DQ. So this, uh, we will define a new category called the mesh category associated with this repetitive quiver that will be somehow a model of the derived category. So mesh category. I will denote it like this. So the objects of this category are the vertices of this quiver objects of the mesh category, the vertices of the repetitive quiver, and the morphisms are going to be paths in the quiver, modulus certain specific relations. So morphisms a between two objects, two, two vertices, are going to be the paths in the quiver from x to y, modulus certain relations, modulus mesh relations, the idea generated by mesh relations. So what's a mesh? So look at this combinatorial object, this quiver possesses a 
naturally we define translation. Taking a vertex, so the translation goes from the quiver to itself, and it takes a, a vertex to the translation one unit to the left. Right? In general, a mesh would be, we have a vertex here in the quiver, we have its translate, there will be arrows bobbing out from this vertex, and then we will have all, a set of arrows going to the, vert to the initial vertex, we will call this alpha 1, beta 1, uh, one, alpha n, r, beta r. So the mesh relation is the sum of all these paths is going to be zero. So the alpha i, beta i, it's zero. So for instance, in this example, we get this kind of, uh, of quiver where the only mesh relations are this one, <coughs> this part, that does this part is going to be zero. And we have also this mesh relation saying that this composition is going to be zero. Yes? So, so remember, we're only considering <coughs> thinking quivers. They are really, a, this, this repetition quiver are really easy to, to imagine, to picture in your head. And the mesh relations will look really similar to those, those ones. So, uh, yes, so the theorem of Huckel. The 86 is that the in the composable objects, the category of indecomposable objects over the derived category, it's equivalent to the mesh category of, uh, of the repetition quiver. So, in this part of the picture, we, we have described this, this category. We have described also this function, tau. We have heard tau, so the tau minus one is just the shift of the vertices is one unit to the right. And uh, the other functor, sigma functor, will be described uh, using uh, the triangulated structure of the direct category. So in a combinatorial way, it's much more difficult to, to, to describe the, the sigma. So let me recall that. So recall. This derived category is a triangulated category. So by definition, it, it's endowed with a automorphism, yes, <coughs> which we will not describe, describe combinatorially. So the Pierre Gibb already mentioned that this authors Buan, Marsh, Reinecke, Reiten, and Todorov define the cluster category as the bounded the right category, orbit category with uh, this functor. <coughs> so what does this symbol mean? Orbit category. I will erase this. So if we have a orbit category, means that if we have a, a k linear category, then the object of this thing, of this category, and f an automorphism of the category are going to be the same as the object of A 
and the morphisms in the other category is going to be the direct sum taken the morphism in the object and in the orbit. Right? So in the special case of uh, for instance of our eight tree quiver, we we have the, the derived category look like uh, in the composable objects look like this. The translation factor inverse will be like this. This is x, this is time minus one. And the sigma functor will, I mean, the best way to describe it in this example is we have triangles here that form. We will shift this to the next copy of the triangle. So this is sigma minus one x. And when we say that we're taking the orbit category, well, we will think that this is a fundamental region of the orbit category. So Pierre already mentioned that the good fact about this category is that it, it in the composable objects behave as the generators of the cluster algebra and the direct uh, relation between categorification and cluster algebra is given by the cluster character. So here, just to have an idea in your head of how should the generators of the cluster algebra would look like? Well, they would look sort of, we will have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine generators, and the relation sort of will be codified by the mesh relation in some sense, in some sense that I will not make precise. So, so our goal was to introduce a more sophisticated type of cluster algebra, cluster algebra with coefficients. So, I will not say why, but uh, there are many mathematicians that already define which is the correct framework to categorify this. So, so one, Marsh, uh, no, Iyama, Python, and Scott uh, uh, propose a framework to categorify, to categorify cluster algebra with coefficients. Instead of taking triangulated categories as this one, we will have to have Frobenius category. Frobenius category. With some extra structure that is analogous to that one that mentioned by Pierre Lee. So it should be a cruel Schmidt, contain a cluster tipping object in some sense. Uh, so be two calabillao, so this means uh, X finite. I will recall, okay. First, a Frobenius category, it's an finite exact category. So it's exact category. In the sense of Quinan. So. Okay, you don't know what an exact category is. It's sort of category that possesses uh, shortest exact sequences, or equivalently, um, extension close subcategory of a model category. So that's an exact category with enough projectives and injectives. And such that the projectives are equal to the injectives. So we will ask for a Frobenius category, which is x finite. It could be on infinite, 
that's a very different with this setting. Uh, it has a cluster tilting object. In the sense of the last lecture, and third, two calabijao. So why, why should we look at this kind of categories? So another theorem of Tappel is that if E is a Frobenius category and P is the subcategory of projective objects, then the quotient category of E modulo the idea of morphism factorizing so two objects of the, in this category is a triangulated category. Moreover, if I have an exact function, so in particular preserved projectives, there will be an induced function in this module in this quotient category and this function will be triangulated. It will be noticed, this stable category will be noticed by E on the line. So this is a triangulated category and this function is a triangulated function. So philosophically, we are adding projective objects to a triangulated category, some objects, uh, and uh, this philosophically will correspond to this extra like, data, this initial choice of coefficients, this initial choice of initial conditions. So, philosophy. corresponds to the initial conditions. interpret these initial conditions will in, in the category setting will be adding projective objects to, to the category. So let me okay, let me give some explicit examples. Example of a Frobenius category. It's a module category of a self-injective algebra. Okay, but we're not interested in this kind of example. We're interested in kind of examples that look like this. Yeah. So we're interested in. <coughs> How to put projective injective objects in this picture, making the whole picture being a Frobenius category, which has the stable category, the, 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 the right category of a quiver. So, so let's. Uh, so, we began with an ACQ quiver. We will construct a Kramit quiver. So I will record it just in an example. A3. So for for each vertex of the original quiver, we will add a blue vertex, a copy of the vertex, and we will put it in a box.
and we will add arrows. So we have one vertex and it's cutting. So we will add one arrow. Um, the original vertex to its copy. We can consider the repetitive quiver associated to this frame quiver. So for instance, in type A3, we will have to draw contact the many copies <laughs> of the quiver we are looking at. And we should have to add connecting arrows. So here I have an arrow from this vertex to this one. So I have an arrow from this one to the next copy of the, of the original one. The same with this one. And etc. <coughs> so I get this uh, this kind of picture, right? So I will write in blue the subquiver that we were we already look at this one. So in green we can see the 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 vertex we already consider the the vertex describing the derived category of the of the motor category associated to the quiver. So here we have add some blue objects. Yes. We would like to to consider the path category associated to this quiver, and uh, and we would like it to be a provenance category, right? <coughs> So we, we will have to leave the mesh relations. The mesh relations were this one, remember? So, so a definition by Keller and Shirovsky. Two thousand and thirteen. It's the. Uh, Error category associated to this quiver. By definition, the path category associated to the repetitive quiver associated to the primate quiver model the modulo the non-frozen mesh relation. So why I say non-frozen? We will consider the blue vertices as frozen vertices. So we will consider only mesh relations whose <coughs> endpoints are not frozen vertices. So mesh relations whose endpoints are non frozen. So in particular, the translation of this frozen vertex will be this one. We will have a mesh here, but this composition will be different of zero. This composition will be different of zero. So as a parenthesis, this, this category is called air, from regular Nakajima category, because it's related with a a kind of canonically, uh, canonical variety construct from the quiver introduced by Nakajima that it's also relevant for cluster theory, but I will not say anything about this. If you, if you are interested in, cluster, in Nakajima categories, there's a, a strong connection with this uh, quiver. So theorem. The theorem of Keller and Shilovsky, the same year, is this category is a Frobenius category. Such that uh, it's a stable category 
it's triangle equivalent to the derived category associated to the quiver. And this, the intuition is really clear. Taking the stable category will be killing all these blue vertices. And if we kill these blue vertices, we only get the green part of the quiver, which corresponds to the quiver of the in the composable context <coughs> of the derived category. Yes? So it's a Frobenius category with a stable category like this. Moreover, it's a Kroll Smith category. And moreover, we have a translation functor and a sigma functor which leads to this Frobenius category. So, sigma and tau lead to automorphisms. Of, uh, so we have a nice candidate to take the orbit categories. So, uh, so PRC is a good candidate. Sigma. It's a good candidate to category five cluster algebra with coefficients. So cluster algebra with coefficients. Okay. Unfortunately, it's uh, it had some. Uh, it fails to be a categorification. It fails to be a truly Smith category. Remark. <coughs> it's not a truly Smith category. Yes. So I will. For example, in the A2 case, we will, this will be A2, we get this category. So this is an X, the translation is this one, and the shift is this one, so this is sigma tau minus one X. We will get that the endomorphism algebra in this category of an object is isomorphic to a polynomial algebra, which is not local. So we will have to complete in some sense. So, so the solution of this problem is to consider completed orbit categories.
Yes. So in order to have a well-defined compo uh, decomposition, a well-defined composition will be given by the formula. Uh, so we have a an element here. So it's a sequence of fi. So fi goes from x to f i of y, and I have gi that goes from y to f g what, uh, z. So the composition of these guys is going to be the sum. They will be composed sort of polynomials. So it's going to be f i <coughs> A, F, A, G, B. So, as you can see, F, I goes from X to F, I, Y, and F, I, A, and F, A, G, B is going to be from F, A to B to Z. Right? So in order to this, this sum to be finite, we have to add a technical hypothesis. That is, we need to add an hypothesis. That is, uh, the homomorphism from x to f l y are zero for l sufficiently small. So we can just decompose c in a finite number of ways. Yeah. And this is the case in this kind of, of categories, because they are directed to the right, in some sense. And the function sigma, tau minus 1, take everyone to some, something to the right. So if I take the inverse, at some point, I will go left to the original point, and we will have this the condition satisfied. So my theorem is that uh, for two adding inquiry, the regular, the air category, and taking the orbit category with respect to the same function, is a categorification. of a cluster algebra with coefficients. Uh, moreover, it's a categorification of the universal choice of coefficients. And I will say a couple of words on, on this. A categorification. The universal choice of coefficients. So, what do I mean by universal? Since I was a little bit uh, a sketch with respect to this uh, choice of initial data, I cannot give the, the precise definition, but I can hint to the, the idea. So we will have a cluster algebra defined by the same quiver and some choice of initial conditions that will live here. change. 
Google. So, what means to be universal? So we will have an universal uh, choice of initial delta if the if for any other initial data, I will I can have a morphism of this part of the ring of the coefficient that extends. So what the property said is that no no matter how big is M prime, there will be a fixed M and a fixed choice of initial data, so that I can map the Y i's to elements in this orange part, such that this map extends to the map on the whole cluster algebra. So I will stop here. Thank you very much.